church camp. And uh, we're excited about what God's going to do in Jesus camp. Jesus is Lord, Lord Kurios. Kurios is the Greek word for Lord, and we're going to be uh, centering the messages, if you will, and the theme around Jesus is Lord for church camp. And then, of course, uh, starting tomorrow at, uh, I'm going to get there around 5, but I think 7 o'clock is the worship service at Spring Bluff, 3rd, 6th grade boys camp. This is through the Southern Baptist in our area. Uh, they have honored and invited me to come and preach to them this week, so I'm excited about that. Roughly about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I'll be giving three devotionals, the same devotional but three different age groups. I'm assuming they just divide them up so that it would be age appropriate. And then that evening, each evening at around 7, I'll be preaching. I would love for you to lift me up during that time. And then, of course, starting on the 16th, which is two Sundays. No, it isn't. It's next Sunday. Yeah, the 16th is next Sunday. Uh, that evening will be dismissed here, and we will be having our church camp out at Jesus Camp at Richwoods. If you can make any of those evening services, I would just beg and love for you to come. Uh, it is a very special time. Uh, the That last song that we sang, if my memory serves me right, I was exposed to it first at church camp uh, through one of uh, Mandy's praise teams, um, I think Brandon Weiss was even in that group back then, and it was an amazing experience. You know, it's one thing and a wonderful thing to be here amongst our uh, loved ones and our Christian brothers and sisters to worship. That's one thing, and it's a good thing. It's another to be in an outdoor setting that you can see almost 35 miles, the Labity Stacks type thing uh, at that worship facility uh, there at Richwoods. And so if you can join us, I would invite you to do so. I last week told you that we are starting a series on famous sayings. So uh, one of the famous sayings, and, and this is just one of my favorites, for such a time as this, Mordecai is speaking to his niece, Esther. How do we know that you have not been brought to this position as queen of the Medes and Persians? for such a time as this. Church, the simple title of this message is Facing Discouraging Times with Determination. Facing Discouraging Times with Determination. If I have to convince anybody here today that we are living in discouraging times, let's get together. I'll buy your cup of coffee or your soda, and we'll talk about what's going on. They were called the men at Berea in the New Testament and the men of Issachar in the Old Testament, but they were both commended because they were men who understood the times. Church, we cannot afford to stick our head in the sand any longer. We cannot hide behind the excuse well, what they do will not affect us because it will. It has, it does, and it is. It's affecting us. <clears throat> 20 years ago, when certain lifestyles started being assumed and said as okay, that was the excuse. It's not, what they do is not going to affect you. Now they are passing legislation in states that if you don't affirm your child's gender identity, you are an abuser. Michigan, California, true story. This is legislation that is going to the governor's desk. Excuse me just for a minute. <laughs> but I can preach while I'm doing this. Maybe. Maybe. And maybe not. So, that all makes for exciting TV, I'm here to tell you. Now, I'm here, I'm not, if we have anyone in this congregation struggling with these issues, thinking about these things, we love you. And we want to help you. 
You may disagree with our opinion. Let's sit down and talk it through. If we can agree on this, watch this. The word of God is our only rule for faith and practice. Then I know that sooner or later, we're going to come to a level of agreement somewhere. And if it's not, then we'll start there. And we'll figure out why someone would ever say that the word of God is my only rule for faith and practice. We want to love you through this. And if we have to get to that point where we say we're going to agree to disagree, we will. Watch this. Agreeably. But we have, in, in 2023, church, we have to take a stand. And if it was right for Esther to do it, it is certainly right for us to do it. Right after first service, a fella came to me and shared with me something that would shock you that is happening in Missouri. Because we feel pretty protected here. We have a conservative governor, conservative house, yada, yada, yada. But the reality is, is that many of these things are coming for our state as well. I heard something in college that I didn't agree with, but now I absolutely do. And what they said in college was, whatever they do in California will be in your state seven years later. It's 100% accurate type thing. You know, give or take a year uh, and the such. Sometimes it's a lot faster. But it's important for us to understand that we are living in discouraging times. But church, take heart. There's some good movement too, though. There's some good movement. We've got some good things happening in the United States of America. For one, people are fleeing these states that are doing these types of things. And they're coming to red states. And guess what happens when they bring their resources to red states? Those red states are having financial booms. Now, I'm convinced. I'm convinced that we are the Israelites at Mount Carmel in the United States of America. Elijah said, let the God who answers by fire be God. And God did answer by fire on Mount Carmel. Do you know what the United States of America equates as fire? Economic blessing. I believe it. And if this nation can see God bless godly states, I believe we're going to win a lot of people to Jesus. Now, once we win them to Jesus, we can teach them, you need to quit seeing money as your God. Amen, church? That's called discipleship. I love that T-shirt that says, you catch them, he'll clean them. <laughs> and, and, and so we bring them to Jesus, and then Jesus disciples them how they ought to think, act, and the such. That's our job as a church. Look at what the, the three pivotal Supreme Court rulings two weeks ago that support our Constitution and support our biblical way of life. Good things are happening. Now, I love what Ron Dunn says, that good and bad travels on parallel tracks, and they often arrive at the same time. And so here we are in a nation that, yes, some good things are happening, but oh my goodness, we are in really big trouble. And so we need to know how can we encourage ourselves, how can we face discouraging times with determination. First of all, excuse my drink. We need to ask ourselves what was going on before we read Esther chapter 4. If you don't mind, turn there in your Bible, Esther chapter 4. But before we read that, we're going to, uh, if you will, catch us up on the history as to what's going on. You understand that uh, in the Bible days, when the Israelites, we talked about the circle, they would sin, and when they would not repent... God would judge them, and they would be put into captivity. Then they would repent after they were punished, and then God would forgive them and bring them out of captivity. So at the book of Esther, they've been brought out of captivity, but watch this, only a very few have went back to Jerusalem and Israel. And so the lion's share of the Israelis were scattered throughout now the Medes and Persians because the Medes and Persians took over uh, from the Babylonians. And if you will, watch this, they got comfortable. They had a life. And it wasn't worth it to them to obey God, to go back to their home country where they would have nothing 
and start over with God's blessing. So they stayed where they were for their kingdom's sake, and now they're in trouble. You see, church, when we don't follow God, we get in trouble. He loves us enough not to allow us to stay the way we are. He loves us enough to call us out of that sinful life. And so what has happened is in this book, uh, and I was told I said the name wrong, but there's two possible ways to say the name. We're going to go with Xerxes because I live with the person that told me I was saying it wrong. (laughs) And she's not sitting right there. King Xerxes, King Xerxes said... uh, I got got a smile. Good deal. I got a smile. King Xerxes had a queen named Vashti. And this is a very interesting study. And if you got time today or through the week, read the book. It's an excellent read. But he got in a drunken situation with several of his guys, and he decided, I'm going to show off my queen. The Bible says she was beautiful. And so he sends for King Vashti just to stand in front of these drunken men and for them to Google and oogle at her. And you know what she said? Apparently she had quite a bit of character. She said, thanks, but no thanks. Amen. Well, now we got a problem. There's something about the law of the Medes and Persians that I was taught in college. You never missed with the law of the Medes and Persians. It, it could never be changed. And the king was, he, he could set down laws. Now, he didn't set down a law for her to come, but she has basically said to the king, eh, I got my own mind, and I'm simply not going to come and be an object of you and your men's lust. That's a, that's a good stand. But the king was drunk, and he got with his guys and said, what on earth? can we do? And apparently, this is J. Vernon McGee's words, apparently the guy that gave the suggestion, he had a difficult woman at home and he didn't want her thinking that she could tell him what he, you know, was supposed to do. So he said, you tell, you get her out of here. Send her into exile so that all the women may know that they got to do what we say. Now, I know what some of you, yeah, some of you are already saying, Lord help, we got those same problems here in 2023. We do. We do. You know why? Because the Garden of Eden. <laughs> we do. We, we've got those issues. Now, watch this. I do marital counseling, so just get, I got plenty of dates open. You get with me if we've got issues. But he was wrong, church. He was wrong. And he lost his beautiful queen because of his drunken stupidity, okay? And now we need a queen. Well, they hold a beauty contest. And in that beauty contest, Esther is found to be, in this king's eyes, the most beautiful woman in his kingdom. So like that, boom, she's queen. She went from a nobody, a know-nothing, a do-nothing, if you will, to queen of the Medes and Persians. Two more storylines. Mordecai was a Jew the uncle to Esther. We're going to talk more about that here in just a minute. And he was a good guy. Good guy, good Jewish, godly man. And he was excited for Esther, but also, Lord help, what does this hold? But he had an issue with another man that had become basically second in line from King Xerxes. And his name was Haman. Haman was Hitler before Hitler was cool. Haman hated Jews. And so Haman comes up to King Xerxes and says, you know, King, you may not even be aware of this, but you've got a group, you've got an ethnicity of people within your people that they don't serve your gods, they don't agree with you, they don't even abide by your government, they have their own government. I mean, he made up all this stuff. And King, I I don't even think they should exist. And the king did this. Here you go, Haman. Whatever you say, you got the king's ring. You need money? You got money. You got the silver, the Bible says. And Haman went, 
And he wrote on the, I think it's the 15th day of the month of Adar, which was not very far from this point uh, in history. All of the Jewish people within the Medes and Persians kingdom can be wiped out. Every person that knows of a Jew, it's your responsibility, if you're a Mede and Persian, to wipe that family out and get rid of them. So says the king. Boom. And it was done. And decrees were sent out. And Mordecai comes across one of these decrees, and he's devastated. We're fixing to read that here in just a moment. Here's the last thing you need to know about Mordecai and Haman. They knew each other. They hated each other. Mordecai knew the character of Haman, and he refused to show obeisance to him. But the problem was Haman had been brought to the second basically in command, and the, the decree had went out, wherever Haman goes, everybody else is supposed to show uh, obeisance to him, and Mordecai wouldn't. And every time Haman went out and everybody else bowed, and Mordecai would go, nope. It made Haman fight mad. Can you imagine? I'm second to the king. Bow before. Nope. Not doing it. I know who you are. Now, last thing you need to know. I think I've said that twice now, so we're almost done with this part. Mordecai had sniffed out by God's providence a deathly two bakers in the kitchen that they were trying to kill the king. And Mordecai saw it. And he outed them. And, of course, they were taken care of. And the king was saved because Mordecai showed him of a military coup that was going to happen through food. They were going to poison him to death. So you need to know all those things. That's the history. That catches you up. Here we go. Now, let's stand for the reading and reverence of God's holy word. Remember, we got done early in first service, so take heart. Here we go. Esther chapter 4. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, and this is after the decree has went out that all the Jews could be killed, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Can you imagine if tomorrow morning you wake up and you hear that it has passed the uh, you know, the Congress, it has passed the Senate, and President Biden has signed it. Christianity is illegal. I can't imagine. I would be struggling with just as these guys are struggling. Verse 4. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hattach, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend unto her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hattach went from, to, from I'm sorry, forth to Mordecai under the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to cha charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make request before him and for her people. Now, that sounds extremely sensible and reasonable. Here's the problem. And Hattach came and told Esther the words of Mordecai, and again Esther spake unto Hattach, and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. So here we have the problem. You know, I'm sure Esther's first thought was, I'd be glad to speak to the king, but. This is the law of the Medes and Persians. You cannot approach the king in his court without being summoned. And if you do, then the king has to make a decision to take your life or to spare it. Look, I think she's basically saying, Uncle, do you realize what you're asking me to do? So this is the response. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. 
Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. In other words, Esther, this will affect you. You know, this in church, I'm not pointing or shooting at anybody here. I don't know that I've heard anybody say this here, but I have heard this for the last 20 years. Why do you care about what someone else does? It's not bothering you. Yeah, yeah, it is. It truly is. Look at verse 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also in my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Father, we just beg you, because these are perilous times, and we love everyone. We don't want to be misunderstood. But, oh, God, we've got to stand with you. So we're praying and begging for you to help us to not be discouraged and to meet discouraging times with determination. Lord, we, everyone in this room, has been called to this place and time for such a time as this. We ask your power and blessings to be added to the reading and preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. You may be seated. So here's a sermon in a sentence that I forgot to read until the end of the sermon at first service. The question is not how can I skirt, escape, or otherwise survive these discouraging times, but instead, what has God called me to do to influence, change, and lead others in these discouraging times? How can I be a change agent? That's what we have been called to be and do. This is what we pray for every Sunday morning, that we would be so enamored and empowered with God that we will not shirk or fear man, but that we will stand for God's love and laws for such a time as this. And church, this is what God has called us to we're alive in 2023. How many times have you thought and wondered, oh, I wish I could have been born back then? No, because there were evil times then too. You have, we're here, and we're here for such a time as this. So point number one, simply put, she had her own reality. She had her own reality. And church, I, I don't think we should understate this. We are absolutely sidetracked sometimes with our own reality. We know our insecurities. We know our insignificances, if you will. We know our evil mind. We know ourselves better than anybody. And when we get faced with something like this, we're like, this is beyond me. We can't, what am I going to be able to do? So what was some of her reality? Uh, so, Dr. Hooks, I, I kind of, you know, I let them know what you told me. So if, if I have betrayed a confidence, you're just going to have to forgive me because we're brother-in-laws and we're stuck with each other. I didn't give a lot other than to say that she was an orphan. Esther was an orphan. This is an area that Brother... Dr. Hooks is studying and, and researching right now, and it, it's blessing him. This study is blessing him. But watch this. <laughs> it's not a blessing to you if you're an orphan. And even though uh, Dr. Hooks and I both can relate now that at a well-advanced age, we don't have our mom and dad, can you imagine being an orphan at three, four, five, six, seven, eight? I, I can't imagine. She could imagine. She went through it. If it wasn't for her Uncle Mordecai, she wouldn't have anybody right now. And she's feeling that. You're asking me to put my life on the line, and I haven't even been dealt a good deck. We're, we're going to answer that here in just a moment. 
She was an orphan. Next, under she had to own her reality. She was a slave. Even though they had been essentially freed and they were allowed, she was a slave. Her people had been brought into slavery. Church, listen to me. Every one of us are a slave to something or someone or some thought. We're slaves. If I knew you guys wouldn't tell anybody else, I could tell you some of the stuff I'm a slave to. But I know you. (laughs) It'll be all out on Facebook and everything. And if I could give you some truth serum, I would hear what you're a slave to. That's why we do CR. That's why we do discipleship. Because church, we're all slaves to something. And, And we feel that. We own our reality. You don't know. You're putting, you're giving me too much credit. You ever said that? You're giving me too much credit. And this is what she's struggling with. Watch this. And at this point, she realizes she's doomed. She's going to die one way or the other. She's either going to die at the hand of her husband or she's going to die at the hand of Haman. She owns her reality. And church, boy, if God doesn't do something for us, we don't have any hope. And, but God lovingly does that every day. He steps into our mess every day. Lastly, she was a Jew. She was a Jew. Now, now we're starting to get, though, to the positivity stuff. Watch this. She was an orphan. What does God say? God says, I will be a father to the fatherless. She was a slave. What does God say? God says, I will set you free. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. She was doomed. God gives you a new reality, a new future. And then lastly, a Jew. Do you know what that meant? She was a chosen child of God. Every person, under the sound of my voice, that you've repented of your sins, you accepted what Jesus did on the cross for your sins, you are a child of God. Watch this. You are in the line of being an heir to the throne. It's not a throne you'll ever take because Jesus is never going to relinquish it, and there's no power able to take it from him, but you're in the line. You're a child of God. You're a royal blue blood. You have all the resources at your hands that you need for what God wants you to do. Point number two, she had to accept her God-given beauty. She had to accept that. Watch this, church. Every one of you have a supernatural spiritual gift that was given to you at salvation, and you have the power from heaven to accomplish what God wants you to do. You can serve God competently. You have a gift. She was beautiful. She had status as a result. Church, you have standing with God. Some of you think those people in my work, they could care less who I am. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they think. It matters what God thinks. God can remember Joseph, and we're going to get to him eventually, but Joseph went from a jail cell participant to second in the kingdom. God did that. Nobody in that kingdom wanted Joseph to be elevated to that level, but it didn't matter because God set it in stone. And it doesn't matter your situation right now. It matters what God thinks, and he can set you where he wants you. How about this? Access. She had access to the God of the universe. Everyone in this room that knows Jesus Christ, you have access Someone said something to me recently, and it was basically, I just don't think I pray enough. <laughs> Ooh, folks, we're leaving so much on the table when we don't pray enough. We're, we're, we're leaving a lot of godly power, if you will, change on the table when we don't pray as the Holy Spirit would have us to. Point number three, she had to see that she was a part of the answer. Church, I'm here to tell you, every one of us are a part of the answer. Even if it's just godly influencing our kids, our loved ones, our husbands, our wives, our neighbors, our workmates, we are a part of the answer. And we have been put here for such a time as this. How about this? These blessings brought responsibility. 
all of the blessings that she had been given, it brought a level of responsibility. Who else in that kingdom that was a Jew had the ability to get the mercy shown upon her that the king was going to show nobody? Mordecai would probably have died at the king's hands. Any other Jew would have probably died under the king's hands. But Esther, his beautiful wife, she would get the golden scepter. And I don't know if you know the rest of the story, but when she walked in, he gave her the golden scepter. She came up to him and, you know, he was shocked and surprised. It had been 30 days. He knows the law. She knows the law. Babe, what are you doing? I've got a request. Okay. And if you read the scripture, up to half of my kingdom, that was him saying, babe, anything you want. Anything you want. What's so funny is Gavin will still say that to this day. If he needs a soda or something, he said, half of my kingdom for a soda, you know. And one of these days, I'm going to take him up on it. But so here's the deal. Thank you for laughing. That was just a joke. Uh, when they had the meeting, and she invited Haman too. When they had the meeting, all she said was, I now want to invite you to a banquet just for you, hun, and Haman. Okay, anything, babe, up to half my kingdom, anything. So now they're at the banquet. One little thing that you got to know before the banquet happened. The king couldn't sleep one night. Hmm, imagine that. The next time that you can't sleep, and Dawn and I are going through this age thing, the next time that you can't sleep, turn to the Lord and say, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? What do we need to do? What do we need to talk about? Get to the word of God, soak. Start praying for just amazing, wonderful things to happen. Pray for Brother Ben to become a good preacher. All those neat things. You know, you know what's going to happen? The devil's going to make sure you get sleepy in a hurry. <laughs> you know? and, and yes, that's kind of a joke, but the reality is, is that if we'll take that opportunity, it can be used for the kingdom's sake. So the king starts reading the chronicles of his recent past in his kingdom. And guess whose name he comes across? Morta. Kaya. And what had he done? He had sniffed out that military coup, and it hits him like a ton of bricks. <gasps> We've not honored this guy. And right at that time, Haman walks in to the king's chamber. And the king, you know how men do to each other. We just, we just launch into mid-thought. The guy doesn't know what in the world we're talking about, but we just ask an a, a question. What would you do? What would be the best way for a king to show honor to a citizen? And Haman went, ooh, he talking about me. He talking about me. Well, king, let me tell you, I'm telling you right now, if I, if I were you and I was wanting to honor a citizen, I'd give him my best apparel, I'd put my crown on his head, I'd put him on my best horse, and I'd have heralds to go with him throughout the kingdom saying, this is how God treats the man, I'm sorry, the king treats the man that he wants to honor. J. Vernon McGee believes that Haman believed that King Xerxes sooner or later would mess up to the point that he, Haman, would become king. And he was basically preparing the people for the change. And King Xerxes said, yep, do all that for Mordecai. And Haman went, Mordecai who? What? What? Yep, do all that for Mordecai because I haven't done that yet. He saved my life. I, please, and you take care of it. I want you to be one of the heralds. <laughs> and so he goes throughout the kingdom. This is how the king treats the man that he wants to honor. The Bible says that after that, he was so depressed. He put a cloth over his head. He went home, and he basically whined and complained to his family. Now, you need to know this. He had built a gallows, a hangman's noose for Mordecai for the 15th day of Adar. And so then some of his wise people say, hey, King, or, or Haman, aren't you supposed to be with the queen and king tonight for your banquet? Oh, my goodness. So he rushes off. And it's at this banquet that he hears from the queen's mouth, I'm a Jew. Haman is trying to destroy me and my people. And the king goes, say what? And the rest is history. Haman was hung on the same gallows that he built for Mordecai. And the children 
of Israel were saved once again. Church, remember, the children of Israel that were living in a place that they had already been called out of, we mess up, we struggle. That doesn't mean God gives up on you, but it does mean you need to get right with God so that you can get under the spout where the glory comes out. Let's close it up. Her uncle gave great advice, church. Please hear me. Sometimes you may not be the person in the hot seat, but you may be the person that God is using to support the person in the hot seat. And do not whiff when that time comes. I, you know, all of us know that it's easy to go, oh, yeah, if I were you, I would try to avoid that at all costs. <laughs> no, no. This is your chance. This is your chance to stand for righteousness. Do it and accept whatever comes. Encourage them for such a time as this. Mordecai knew what he was asking, and he was willing to suffer the same fate. And he was asking his niece that he had poured godly righteousness into, do the right thing, hon. You are in a position. God has so honored and blessed you. Do the right thing. Point number five, and we'll finish this up. Our deliverance is not dependent upon our resources, but our obedience in face of peril. So simply put, God's power will deliver. God's ways will triumph. God's people will rally. Church, please hear me. When we start seeing revival fires burn, we're going to rally. If revival fires start to burn here, people will rally. You've seen it. So I did text Gavin and Denise earlier in the week as I was preparing for this, and I said, you've seen the uh, show in Branson because Branson is doing a theater show on Esther. What did you walk away with? And this is what Gavin said. Mordecai, I don't want things to be easy. I want them to be right. Church, we need a revival of that attitude. What? And amens rang throughout the building. <laughs> yeah, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. But we want things to be right. They're not hardly ever going to be easy. Denise said this, when we are doing what God has asked us to do, we can be bold and courageous. Remember what the three Hebrew children said? We don't have to be careful, O king, to answer you in this matter. This is what we're going to do. When you, when you have had a Bible conference with God every morning, and now you're standing in front of the magistrates of this world, you can stand there in boldness because the God of all things is supporting you. You remember the old crotchety preacher that brought an injunction against the movie theater back in the day? And the movie theater owner, who happened to be the mayor, said, I'll starve you out, preacher. And he said, you'll have to starve Almighty God first. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So I want to read it to you one more time. Oh, you, you guys didn't get a short sermon. I'm sorry. The question is not, the question is not, how can I skirt, escape, or otherwise survive these discouraging times? But instead, what has God called me to do to influence, change, and lead others in these discouraging times? How can I be a change agent? Will you stand, musicians? Will you come? If you're here today and you've never, ever received Jesus Christ as your Savior, please come on the first note. Come on the first song. I'm sorry, the first word of the first verse of the first song. Uh, come. And we'll send you a someone gender appropriate. They'll share the gospel with you. This would be a great day to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Maybe you just need to turn this into an old-fashioned altar. Our nation needs prayer like no other. Would you come, whatever the case may be.